As is family tradition here at Brick in the Yard Mold Supply, we're going to make a silicone hand for my youngest daughter, who uh, will now have a matching silicone hand, just like her older sisters. Now, to begin with, we'll be uh, needing a container in which to create our mold. For that, we're going to use a small oatmeal container. Now, in this video, we're going to be recapping uh, a lot of material we've covered in previous videos, but one of the focuses that I wanted to have on this video is about uh, creating realistic flesh tones. So, pay extra attention to that part. We get a lot of questions about creating flesh tones with silicone and more specifically about uh, the function of flocking versus pigment. So, we'll get into all that in just a minute in the casting phase, but for now, just to recap some quick uh, live casting tips. Anytime when we're molding hands, I like to use a minimal amount of release, uh, usually just a small amount of Vaseline. And the reason I'm using Vaseline for this is uh, it's oil-based and uh, it won't affect the silicone curing later on if any of that transfers to the inside of the alginate mold. And it's just enough of a release to help break the suction on the mold when we're pulling her hand out later on. Now typically when I'm mixing up alginate, I like to mix it roughly one to one. And that's a very forgiving mix ratio. So it's a good idea if you're new to mixing alginate, experiment with that mix ratio a little bit and get a good feel for uh, how you like your alginate. Typically the one to one ratio, if you go exactly one to one, you'll wind up with a, a pretty thick mix uh, that's ideal for making face casts and head casts and that sort of thing. So I usually go a little bit more than one to one and that gives me a little bit more of a, a pourable consistency that's ideal for hand casts. Now another important detail is uh, mixing by hand for these smaller batches like this. I really prefer that just because I can make sure I don't have any little unmixed spots of alginate down in the bottom corners of the bucket. And I can usually do that even faster than I could get a mixer in and out of that bucket and more thoroughly. Now it's important to note that even with really good mixing sometimes you'll have those little little lumps like that. And a lot of times that's from water quality, not from unmixed alginate. So real important because you don't want to mix, uh, waste valuable mixing time trying to get rid of those lumps that are from water quality uh, when you need that time to, to be getting your subject's hand into the alginate. So important to note the difference between uh, unmixed mixed alginate lumps and uh, little lumps that are caused by impurities in your local water source. Now once our alginate is transferred to our mold container we're ready to get our subject's hand into place. Now uh, this is a little Rourke's paw that we're going to mold and real important uh, the, the technique I like to use for this is to push the subject's hand all the way into the alginate and then pull it back out and then massage that into the detail of their hand. And that ensures a very nice bubble-free mold. If you just take your hand, plunge it straight into the alginate and leave it, a lot of times you wind up with a lot of bubbles on the uh, uh, undercut areas of your hand. So real important detail there, that one little step can save you a lot of imperfections in a cast. And now we've got that in place and we're ready to let that set up. And again, as I mentioned earlier, because this is a, a kid's hand and we're using 590, which is normally a five minute set time with 90 degree water temperature, I mix this with actually fairly warm water, warmer than uh, 90 degrees, probably more like 100, 110 degrees. And that allowed the alginate to set up faster. And as you can see there, uh, Rourke's able to now peel it off my fingers. And that's a good thing when you're working with kids, something to distract them and be able to see uh, when the alginate has set up and then we're ready to start removing the hand cast and the main thing we have to worry about here is suction and it's mainly a concern for the alginate mold that we don't want to create a rip on the inside of the mold or any kind of deformity in the mold so you want to take your time very carefully pulling your subject out and my youngest daughter here was very amused by the sound the alginate made when she pulled her hand out which she equated to a tooting sound and now we've got her hand loosened up so we can very carefully ease that out and now we have a perfect hand mold ready for casting. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be pouring this up in silicone, and specifically we're going to be using some of the new FS10 silicone. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, in this part of the tutorial, we're going to be focusing on uh, the process of pigmenting silicone to create realistic flesh tones and the differences between flocking and silicone pigment. Now, just a quick aside, this uh, FS10 is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by weight or volume. And here I'm measuring out about 250 grams of A and 250 grams of B. And also, uh, another aside there about the FS10, it is very low viscosity, so there was no need to vacuum degas this to pour up the hand that we're about to make here. Now, as far as silicone pigments go, to begin, anytime I'm creating a silicone flesh tone, I usually like to start with silicone pigments, and I either use a prefabricated uh, flesh tone or mix my own using primary colors. But when you mix those pigments together, you wind up with one homogeneous color. All of those silicone pigments go into solution and combine to create that new color, that new flesh tone. Now, I usually use that as a starting point, as a base, to then build on that and supplement that with flocking colors. Now, flocking colors, I usually, probably my most uh, common colors I use for that are red and tan and yellow and blue. And what you can do with those, because when you're adding flocking, flocking is basically a tiny little fiber. And that fiber, when it's added to the silicone, unlike the pigment, it does not go into solution. So as you add a pinch of each color, you wind up with little speckles of different colors. And depending on the flesh tone you're going for, you can continue to add the red, the tan, the yellow, blue, and even other colors like greens and pink to supplement that, and your eye will actually do the color mixing for you. And that gets a much more realistic flesh tone because rather than just one homogeneous even color, just like real organic tissue, you get all of these little spots of independent color. Now, when I'm creating fair skin tones, like uh, for my daughter's hand, who's fairly fair, a lot of times I start out with white instead of a flesh tone base. And I use the white as a background color and then add the flocking to that. And that's a really important tip. If you're working with subjects that have very fair skin, it's real important to be able to mix to the lightest flesh tone they have because later on when you go to paint that silicone hand, you want to make sure that you have a very light flesh tone because with uh, silicone, when you're working with translucent materials, you can always go darker, but you can never go lighter without opaquing the original piece. So real important there, find the lightest flesh tone on the uh, subject's hand or face or whatever you're molding and match to that and build on that because, again, you can always go darker with paint, but you can't go lighter uh, without destroying that translucency. So here we've just mixed up a very basic flesh tone using white as a base, and then I've mixed in some tan and some of our flesh tone flocking and a little bit of uh, red flocking, uh, kind of a capillary color. And you'll see later on, we do a close-up of that cast hand. That adds a lot of character that you can't get through just straight silicone pigment. Now, one of the nice things about the FS10, because that is a really low viscosity silicone, it's easy to get a bubble-free casting, but we still have to be careful because uh, Rourke's little fingertips are slightly curled in, so I want to make sure I pour it into the mold and then pour it back out and pour it back out with the fingertips or the palm down and that ensures that any little bubbles that are trapped in the fingertips kind of get burped up out of the uh, hand cast and you can watch for those looking inside the mold you can a lot of times uh, look into the mold and see when those little air bubbles come up and then you know that you don't have any voids in the fingertips and now roughly 20 minutes later our silicone hand is ready to demold and in this video, we're just going to uh, pull this out and show you the end results. We're not going to be covering painting. Uh, we have a lot of tutorials on that process. So be sure to check out the video description. I'm going to post several links to our, our pages of videos on our website with uh, silicone painting tutorials and things like that. So be sure to check that out. If you're unfamiliar with some of these processes, be sure to check the video links. We'll have links to more life casting resources as well as more silicone painting resources. And there you can see in close up, we have those little spots of color. You mainly see the red here, but that just adds a lot of character even before painting. And now you can see a side by side comparison uh, of a hand uh, with silicone pigment and flocking and one with just straight pigment on the right. I have a silicone hand like my sister's.
And of course, all of the supplies used in this video, the Platzil FS10, the pigments, the flocking, and of course, all of the life casting supplies, they're all available on our web store at brickintheyard.com. And be sure to check out the links in the video description. I'll put uh, a link to our life casting page, as well as some links to uh, how to paint and finish uh, silicone props. So check that out. It's all in the video description. And check out, we have plenty of other resources on our website, brickintheyard.com. And thanks again for watching.